What do employees really need to learn about data protection and privacy? A lot of organizations have people who are responsible for these things, and there are a lot of regulations and policies that apply to those people, sometimes only the ones that are really deep into the uh, privacy or data protection area uh, or data breach responses. So there might be confusion around how employees should be trained on these things. So in this session of the Live Cybersecurity Awareness Forum, we're going to dig in with our panel to the topic of data protection and pr uh, privacy training re requirements for employees. So I want to welcome you to the Live Cybersecurity Awareness Forum, uh, the open collaboration group for anyone who's passionate about security awareness. I'm Scott Wright, the CEO and Chief Engagement Officer at ClickArmor, and this is session number 37 for February 7th, 2024. And as usual, I'm joined with an elite group of panelists, <laughs> including Fletus and Ryan and myself. Um, we're we might actually have another panelist or two show up in a minute, but uh, for now, it'll be us and anyone who wants to from the chat can certainly uh, participate by uh, answering or asking questions um, and let us know if you would uh, like to be on the panel. We'll uh, kind of see if we can uh, get you up here, but uh I uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody understands uh, this session uh, is brought to you on a bi-weekly basis by ClickArmor, uh, which is the first interactive security training platform designed specifically to make employees uh, security and privacy training fun and effective. Uh, so if you want to learn more about ClickArmor, you can uh, follow us at clickarmor.ca. Uh, so now for those of you who haven't attended before, just a few housekeeping details. We like to have attendees type in the chat where they're coming from around the world so we can see the international participation. And it also helps get you used to entering stuff into the chat and uh, provides a little more conversation and participation. So uh, another thing that we do, uh, which I will just uh, show you in a second here, is we do uh, record these sessions. Uh, we take the content, we do transcripts, we do video shorts that we post on YouTube and LinkedIn and also in our community, which you should also know about. Uh, it's at members.cybersecurityawarenessforum.com. And we are also issuing on a quarterly basis a CISO report on each of these uh, topics. Uh, we usually cover five or six each quarter. Um, and it's a really a, a, an interesting way to look at, you know, what are the things we've been talking about in the forum that are important to people who are passionate about security awareness. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan and ask him to introduce our panelist. <laughs> <laughs> panelist, yes. Ah, thank oh, you, Scott. Mute, I think. Oh, I thought. Or maybe you're not. I can no? hear you. Ryan. Just an equipment failure. Okay, perfect. You can hear me. Everyone can hear me. Still That's not. Good. Still not hearing you. Oh, everyone, oh, no, uh, except for Scott. anyway, Fletus, Can you hear? Oh, maybe I'm not hearing. There we go. Can Can you guys hear us? We can uh, yeah, I think everything was fine. For some reason, I had on my volume turned down. Pardon me. <laughs> well, I, hello, I everyone. I am here. Uh, I'm uh, good to be back. Missed the, the last session, but uh, heard it was a great one. Um, I'm Ryan from Click Armor, and this is uh, this is Fleetus. Um, Fleetus is a seasoned IT and security professional, uh, currently a security operations manager. Uh, and beyond his expertise, he finds immense joy in sharing his passion uh, for cybersecurity with others. So welcome, Fletus. Thanks for coming back. Um, and uh, yeah, if you also have any questions for us on the panel uh, about the topic, you can always drop them in chat. I'll do my best to, to get them answered. Uh, and as Scott mentioned before, if you uh, even want to speak on the panel, you can let us know and, and, and take the mic yourselves. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it back over to Scott get, to get us uh, kicked off and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a great chat today. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, I figured out what my problem was, which was that uh, I had some, for some reason, changed my my setting for my speaker to be on the computer and not in my oh, earpiece. So it's only been an uh, entire day of technical difficulties. I know. So now, why can't I find my share button? Oh, there it is. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will share the screen. Uh, one second. Uh, there we go. So the way I usually like to start these sessions is with a little bit of context. And I thought, what a better way to start the context off than talking about a few data breaches and how those things affect uh, people and, and employees. So our data breaches that, uh, you know, I found a few recent ones. And and one of my favorite sites is actually databreaches.net. If you haven't uh, used that, it's, it's really good for finding uh, recent breach stories and, and from various different uh, news media outlets. But, you know, there are things about uh, data breaches involving Go Anywhere, uh, hosting companies, uh, 
civil rights. And this one is interesting, uh, a debt agency. It's a medical debt agency that actually um, had a data breach <laughs> around the people that were uh, um, obviously uh, they're collecting the information about them. Um, and I'm not sure if this is the same one, but there was, uh, I just saw in a recent post, uh, a medical debt collection agency went out of business. <laughs> now, how do they go out of business? They're collecting money. <laughs> anyway, guess they're not good um, at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, just to sort of get people in the in the right frame of mind. Um, but anybody, please uh, enter your questions, comments in the chat. We will try and uh, keep an eye on them. Ryan and Fleetus, feel free to point out things that people uh, type in. Um, and what we like to do is uh, a few questions. We'll do a, a poll question and then a general question for discussion, and then we'll go back to poll questions, etc. So in the first poll question, I just need to uh, launch it for folks. Um, but the question is, um, does your organization deliver data protection training for employees to protect sensitive confidential data? And I just need to find the actual window to launch this stuff. And I'm Totally out of control here today. I don't know what's going on, but um, let me get that back. Uh, I will launch it for you. Oh, you can launch it? it? That's perfect. There, there you go. It is. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Ryan. You are welcome. So, um, and while that poll is running, we'll let it run for a few minutes. Um, let's move into like the open discussion. And uh, as I said, people from the, the chat can definitely uh, enter in as well. So what are the most important types of employee decisions that we need to focus on before an attack occurs um, when it becomes uh, comes to data protection. So Fleetus, do you have uh, any thoughts on the types of decisions people have uh, have to make when it, but in or, or in order not not when they're under attack, but when uh, when they're preparing? Sure. Um, we've talked about a few of these in the past. So for those who've been here, you'll all have a few reoccurring topics. So Clean desktop, virtually and physical, just making sure you understand what you're storing um, on your desktops and what's on your physical desk. If you're at home or if you're in the office, make sure you clean it. Uh, data classifications, um, read through your policies, find out if you have a policy on data classification so you understand how to handle your data. Um, make sure you double check your to from when you're emailing documents, if you're physically attaching to make sure that you're sending it to only an internal address uh, that you're not adding um, sensitive data that's personal identifiable or considered health information or credit card, socials, et cetera, depending on your countries, to emails, unless you've got the appropriate classifications turned on to encrypt that email, especially if you're going to send it outbound. Uh, for those who are not aware, when your email leaves your environment, if it's not encrypted, it's plain text. So every device it touches technically can read that email if someone's sniffing the traffic, so be cautious of it. And then lastly, just help your users understand how to classify their data. If they're producing requests for proposals, they're doing R&D work, research and development, that they know where they can store that data. Can it be stored on their laptop or does it have to stay on a network file share? Does it have to stay in a SharePoint that's hardened? Does it have to stay in a cloud repository that is off network because of M&A activity? So mergers and acquisitions is another one. So mm -hmm. a lot of topics I just covered there, we'll dive into most of those, but. Just to recap, understanding your data classification, how do you handle it, when you're mm -hmm. handling it, what precautions you need to take both physically and then virtually as well. Yeah. Ryan, did you have any thoughts? Yeah. I mean, that's a fantastic list. I think two of the things that always jump out to me is uh, number one, understanding where all your data is. Um, you know, one of those, it's kind of like that data inventory and, and we could have pieces of data scattered all over our own systems and our networks and stuff. And that, you know, leads into the classification. Um, so we need to understand what our data is and where to find it. Um, and I think communication is, is again, uh, cross-function teams, you know, it's not just up to the security or the IT personnel to, you know, understand and, and uh, I guess, respect the data and, and the contents of it. That needs to be communicated to all teams. So everyone has the, the, the same responsibility of protecting the data. So you're one cohesive unit. Um, I should, you know, it shouldn't be policy, you know, people chasing you down to make sure you do the right things or the security team always auditing you and telling you it should be, again, that top-down approach. Um, and I think both, you know, both of those things also lead to training. 
So mm -hmm. training the people, you know, what to do with the data. So you know, the decisions that need to be made before a breach, I think, are a lot of these housekeeping items, making sure, you know, policies and procedures are into place, which builds kind of that overall, you know, into that security culture that we keep, you know, kind of going yeah. back to. So hopefully that when a breach does happen, it's not a scatter of like chaos. It's a, oh, we expected this, the unfortunate has happened and we need to go through the proper steps and we know where it is. We have policies, we have, you know, all those things fall into place uh, versus, you know, the, the companies that wake up and to find their data online and it's just complete scramble mode and they don't even know who's responsible for leaking it, like when it could have been breached, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's, there's a lot to consider, but I think, you know, with planning, it can be effectively taken care of. Also, yeah. for those who are IT admins or your people team, HR teams, understanding what rights you're giving people when they're hired. Mm -hmm. uh, Pirelmas and others have showed that finance institutes give access to over several thousand files just on day one, just by default rights. Is that appropriate? Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Just understanding when you give someone their birth rights that mm -hmm. you know exactly what you're granting that user access to, even though for all intents and purposes, you and I as the good guy are not clicking on things for the sake of clicking on it. But if my account gets compromised from a fish or social engineering or something else, they're going to click on every folder, every file to see where they get. You may not as a mm -hmm. valid, trusted employee, you're not going to go clicking around, but a piece of malware will or an adversary will. Yeah, it's great. And, and I mean, it's also something that came to mind while you're speaking there is too, it's consider all, uh, all your attack vectors, um, you know, and it, again, it, it comes down to the inventory and the understanding and the communication. Um, but, you know, insider threats is what popped up in my mind and of how, you know, there's so much data. And as you said, you know, I could, as I could secure employment, it's so, so on day one, I have access to 7,000 pieces of financial data that I shouldn't. And now all of a sudden, you know, I am that insider threat because, uh, I, you know, you you have a policy that's not up to date. You know, you didn't communicate to the right team members. You didn't do the inventory correctly. And then so then your attack vectors, you know, become more prominent uh, because of that. So uh, another great point that it just, it leaks out to so many different areas that, you know, we really have to uh, be yeah. mindful of where all this is. Yeah, I totally agree with those things for sure. And making sure people understand sensitivities and classifications is absolutely the fundamental thing. I think what I think of as well beyond that before the attack actually happens is get people thinking about how they handle information, right? When they when they receive a message or a request from somebody for information, you know, is it something that they normally actually do? Um, so think about your routine handling of information and if your routine handling uh, of information takes into account procedures and policies of the organization, you're going to be using encrypted, you know, devices or avoiding, you know, risky websites, things like that. So just to, to remind people of their normal flows of data so that they can recognize the things that are not normal. And yeah. when somebody's asking them to send information in certain ways or to certain people that they don't normally deal with. Those are the the kinds of the decisions we need people to think about before they actually face an attack, right? And I think one of the big ones now that's new that not many companies are thinking about is what information and data are we putting into these AI and large language models, mm -hmm. right? And, and yeah. again, if we don't have the policies, procedures, communication, and expectations in place before that, then companies are just uploading, you know, potentially, you know, corporate secrets and other personal information that we are just yeah. one large data breach away from a massive exposure of information. So yeah, there's yep. a lot to consider. That's yeah. And it's only, it's only getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Is there, again, just something that we've talked about previously and they don't think about is what are your employees sharing at the coffee shop, at the restaurant, what are they sharing online? Mm -hmm. Because they may feel like it's, minute to talk about an upcoming deal or a client in the airport on speaker. Hey, I'm about to sign this client and I'm going to get them for this price. Their competitor could be behind them and mm -hmm. could come in behind them and steal that deal for like a dollar less or $2 less a seat. Or you could be at the bar having a conversation to a restaurant and you're talking about an M&A activity, merging mm -hmm. acquisition. You just leak data and it's just yeah. conversational stuff or your your seat suite talking about hey my son scored a goal this weekend and posted it on social media now i know i have a social engineering opportunity to, here's a picture of my your son scoring the goal click here yeah. so like it doesn't always have to be data it's mm -hmm. how you communicate 
the information about our companies, about yeah. our personal lives. So don't don't share openly what's going on in your personal life. I know we want to in the social media world we live in today, but you're profiling yourself and making yourself absolutely. Much- Every yeah. prominent social engineering attack is starting from LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, right? Building a profile, finding out what those pe- person's strengths and weaknesses are. And then and then once you make that approach for, for someone who's good at this, it, it's easy because they know so much about you. It's not like meeting a stranger and having to social engineer your way around that. You're already intimately involved in their life if you can quote the fact that they had a an event or a birthday or something, you know, to, to your point of the oversharing. Yeah. And yeah. I believe it Shelley posted, this is, we haven't talked about the data destruction. How long mm-hmm. do you keep data? Yes. Yeah. Are yeah. you destroying your hard drives? Are you destroying the server correctly? Are you degaussing if it's a spinning disk? Are you putting a hole in it if it's solid state? Do you understand? Like you may have a regulatory requirement to keep data for one year, three years, five years, seven years, but are you purging after one, three, five, or seven? Or are you holding on to data it's now putting you to Ryan's point at a bigger blast radius because you held on to data longer than you needed to legally because it was a rainy day event and your policy didn't tell you to purge it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's another aspect or perspective that's similar and that is data minimization, right? If you're designing programs or systems where you're going to be collecting sensitive personal information, especially you want to minimize the amount of data just because the more you have, the more you have to protect or the more risk exposure there is. So getting people to think about how they can minimize sensitive data, you know, that could be at risk uh, is also really important. And we have Uh, to realize just through one last point, we live in a world where data is like a commodity these days. You know, everyone wants data. Every smartphone collects it. Every computer collects it. It it aggregates it. It's all about marketing and tracking and and identifying people and their movements. Like there is so much data swirling around to your point that companies have more data than they know what to do with. Right. And without proper policies and everything else in place, it's just, it's growing and growing and growing. And and to what? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to take a moment. I I didn't uh, yet recognize the people from around the world who've joined us. So wanted to thank, uh, obviously, Fleetus from North Carolina and uh, Ishmael, who's here from Toronto, Shelly from Ohio, Lisa from Tampa, Yassim from Turkey. Awesome. Welcome uh, from overseas. Uh, We've got uh, Tamika Dallas, Asher in Chicago, Tricia in Alberta. Well, lots of people. Daniel, Ontario, and Chile. Well, <laughs> how do you do that? I don't know. So anyway, yeah, thanks a lot, folks, for uh, letting us know where you're coming from. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump back. Hopefully, I can share the right screen this time and uh, get to our next poll question. So uh, in this one, um, I think first is I want to make sure that, uh, well, I, I like to let our panelists uh, vote. I have to do a special setting there because you didn't get to vote on the first one. But uh, the second one is what types of data do employees most need to be trained on? And this is a, a multiple question. You can answer, I think, more than one. Um, but personal data, confidential information, uh, operational data, things like uh, configuration information, right? If you're leaking that kind of information that could be potentially sensitive. I don't know how sensitive people on the call would think that is, Uh, but, you know, intellectual property or other types of data that, you know, I didn't put here, just put data in a, in a chat and um, let us know your other uh, thoughts on that. And we will let this uh, poll run for a little bit and move to our next question, which is how can organizations most effectively integrate data protection and privacy requirements into their security awareness program? So I'll, uh, again, let uh, Fleetus take the lead on uh, this question. Sure, I opened with it. So just helping your employees understand what they can share, where they can share it, and how they can share it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what, when, and how is important for most things. It applies to data protection and privacy as well, because to be honest, I, I get caught in conversations and I have to realize who's in the room because it's it's a need to know. Just because mm-hmm. I know something doesn't mean you need to know something. Yeah. Uh, therefore, the employee of the same company. And this applies to anything from payroll, uh, illnesses or um, medical issues that people may think they can openly talk about, mm-hmm. mergers and acquisitions, as I mentioned, R&D projects, your research and development, or if you're just having basic conversations. Sometimes interdepartmental segmentation is important when it comes to data protection because you don't want to enable someone to do collusion. We haven't talked about collusion on this call yet, but that's where your policies come into play. And you say, I need two or three people to approve something. 
before it can go out. So that stops your BEC attacks. You need two or three people to sign off on something before it can get published so you don't leak data. Yes, those are stop gaps. Those are administrative controls, but they can save your company a lot of money if you understand the administrative controls, not mm -hmm. just technical, control, technical controls that does your data classification, your data labeling. Do you think that um, the, I guess, the method of integrating or approaching data protection training changes with organizations that are more B2C focused? Like if they're collecting personal information for you know online transactions or maybe medical information or things like that? It does. I mean, you got to think about, so another industry that's picked up is your managed service providers. So your MSPs or your MSSPs, your managed security service providers. At any point in time, if you work for one of those, you may have multiple clients information on the same screen at the same time. You could have multiple tabs open and it's easy to have data hygiene issues at that point in time. So for people who work for those companies, making sure that you're not allowing data to move between sessions, mm -hmm. that you, you understand that. The other thing is for an employee focus, be careful what you post when you're building an electronic resume. I don't need to know you're running a Cisco 6500 on this version of firmware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can tell me that when I talk to you. You don't need to tell me that specifically on your LinkedIn profile. And even better, you don't need to put that on your resume that you email out. Because once you email me that resume, you've lost control of that data. And I can disseminate that resume to many different places. I can leave it on my non-clean desk, my non-clean desktop, or I can leave it sitting on the printer. Mm -hmm. Or you so, can upload it to you know AI model and now it's could be publicly available as 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 information. We right? don't talk about that because we're used to bringing paper res or some of us are used to bringing paper resumes to interviews when you sat mm -hmm. down in front of someone. So it was okay because you controlled the piece of paper. Now that you're electronically posting your resume on a LinkedIn and Indeed, uh, Jobs, Monster, whatever, they own that piece of paper. They own that data now and they can mine that data however they want and you have no control of it. So be very cautious. I can't say how many times I've done basic recon of just looking on a job board to find out you're an AD shop, you're a mm -hmm. Linux shop, this is the version you use, because you're hiring for that and you've got too detailed in your job posting on, I'm running this model, mm -hmm. this software, and it's physically located here. It's like self-identifying that you're an Octa Super Admin. <laughs> and then you get fished, and then those credentials are used to, you know, take down. Sounds like something might have happened in that vein. Yeah, Weird, eh? <laughs> Benjamin points it out, and Ben points out, OSINT is is easy. Everything. It's OSINT is, easy. yeah, it's very easy. And I, I mean, you know, not only is it easy just to do from a, a human perspective, but the tools now that are built to do OSINT is are, are just incredible. And with AI, that's you know one yeah. massive advancement that it can collect this data in a matter of seconds and aggregate it for you. That's a, that's a really good point, Ryan. You know what we should do is we we did a, a session on OSINT uh, a long time ago, maybe a year ago. We should do one where we just demonstrate you know how those open source collection tools actually work if we can find people that have uh, licenses for it and just do a bit of a yeah. screen share. Well, I mean, most of them are open. Here. Yeah, most of them are open source. We yeah. could, we could yeah. do some screen sharing through Kali Linux and, and actually just demonstrate yeah. them. I mean, someone could give me their email address in real time and we could we could hunt yeah. them down. <laughs> yeah, we could help them uh, identify their digital uh, footprint. Footprint, yeah, well, yeah. We can't control this and it's because of the data breaches we have today, but I can learn a lot about you just by going, have I been pwned and just putting Ryan's email into that system because mm -hmm. I know Ryan's email. It's meant yeah. to be like Fleetus. But I yeah. can go listen on Ryan just to see where Ryan has used mm -hmm. his personal or click on email for subscriptions. And now yeah. I know you either have an active, had an active, and possibly are reusing that same password across all these systems. And now I have another vector to steal your data. Yeah. And then typically uh, usernames as well. So um, if I was looking for Fleetus, I would capture, you know, his typical usernames, cross-reference those against other social media platforms, uh, because if it's his LinkedIn, you know, username, it could be also his Instagram or his Facebook. That way I could dig out some personal information and come back to to potentially impersonate someone, you know, that, that Fleetus could know and and kind of work a, a phishing uh, scam that way. And of course, the then it goes I into images, Google images. I purposely did this too. I didn't put up a virtual desk on. I did blur it this time. But for you folks, like in general, watch what you have behind you. Like I have my phone <laughs> hanging right now and I have a photo of the local football stadium. Yeah. If you're on calls like this, don't have a whiteboard behind you. Yeah. It's got notes on it that I can just start capturing. 
I mean, I don't care if you know what school I went to. And I don't care if you know I'm a Panthers fan and they've sucked for the last several years. <laughs> but at the same point, I have to blur this background for certain calls or put a virtual background up because that's another way to protect data. Because I mm-hmm. can't stop my employees, but I can educate my employees of not writing or posting stuff that's on camera. Because 90 probably, I'll probably say 90 plus percent of us are on some kind of virtual call every day, even if we work in an office. You're still sharing what's behind you. Yeah. Or and put put your put your data privacy lenses on when you watch the news now, because everyone connects via Zoom, you know, to to do their news updates, yeah. their segments, their their commentary. No yeah, one's really in studio. Swerd yes. or says Sid. Has <laughs> exactly. Idea. Look around their offices. It's absolutely incredible because so many guests come on, and it's maybe their first time, third time, even if it's their tenth time, they don't think from a privacy point of view. What am I sharing? And on you know a national stage, they're sharing yeah passwords. They're showing sharing uh, degrees and diplomas. They're showing geolocation. I mean, and sometimes these are these are former, you know, let's say former ambassador to you know the United Nations. These are people <laughs> that hold significant, you know, power yeah. and weight, but are still just people with email addresses that you or I could fish based on the 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 open source intelligence we gain just during an interview. I'm the amount of data Scott is incredible. Second too, Scott's tough week is my game. He showed yeah, me yeah. Word open. He showed me some words on his screen. He showed me his taskbar. I know what version of OS he's on. Just by that. That was on purpose, by the way. But I mean, it's that <laughs> simple. We don't think about it. Yeah. yeah. You share yeah. your entire desktop versus one tab. I have an idea of every app you have installed, what you have running, what OS you're on. There's just so much data you freely give away that you don't think about. Like right today's and generation. Now, and now, and now that Fleetus and I know what you know, operating system and everything else he's using, we could extract an IP address from a, a previous communication, an email header, et cetera. Now we actually know what we're up against if we're going to be pinging him from the outside, right? We understand configuration. We understand what tools we might need in order to kind of pivot around his environment. So those are the things that you can kind of connect from uh, interaction to interaction that a lot of people don't put the dots together with data. Yeah. But as we can display, it, it leads you right back to that person. Not that I want to be, you know, distracting against that uh, topic but i thought one of the things i wanted to mention was you know using stories and we've had sessions about this using news stories to help people understand you know how they can be at risk uh, or what the risks are that are in the news that they should be aware of and ryan and i were talking about you know the mother of all breaches uh, this morning and we thought we should mention it you know 26 billion records um now we know that those were not all unique records it wasn't a new breach really it was a uh an ag- aggregation of many breaches, but it kind of renews interest in all of those IDs, right? Um, in some ways, what do you think, Fleetus? I mean, this is going to sound bad again, but we're decentralized. This doesn't shock me anymore. Yeah. So, like from a training point of view, and I know there's some CISOs on this call listening and some other practitioners, articles don't give the scare tactic they used to. Headlines yeah. don't use the scare tactic that says, I need to be trained. You need to come train me right now. I read this and be like, okay, I have job security and now I need to go figure out what I want to change. <laughs> yeah. It's that Eeyore moment. Like, yeah. oh, yeah. well, tomorrow's going to happen. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and it just, it, and, you know, to me, it, it, it reminds me and reminds me and reminds me data never dies. Right. So yeah. we, it, it doesn't matter when you, you know, you signed up for that account or when you uploaded that document, it, you know, and just as things get faster and more efficient and, you know, the internet has only become quicker and larger. And now with AI being able to aggregate and search for things in, in, in just seconds, data will never die. And attackers know this. They're utilizing tools that we, you know, we as security researchers may not even know about yet, have only started to see in the wild. Um, and, you know, when things are weaponized, we have to remember that, you know, we have to wait for them to be used in the large kind of up 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 scale attacks before we can really understand how they're being used and then we can have work them backwards and train for them and prevent them and all these different things so we we have to take that initiative to protect our own our data because it's just getting spun around and <laughs> utilized in all different ways oh i don't i do want to before we move on i do want to yeah. pull back for a second because i think it's important sure i don't want this to be fud don't see this as fud uncertainty about right. this is an education opportunity We've talked about all the things you can do wrong, but think about everything you're doing right. It's okay to slip up and share your desktop. It's okay to do things. It's how you respond afterwards. Okay, I won't do that again, or I'll I'll knock, I'll send them a Slack, I'll send them a Teams message. Hey, Pletus, I noticed you did this. Maybe not do this again. 
but you do it with gentleness. Mm -hmm. You do it with respect, not coming in with a hammer. You come in and say, I, as your peer, as someone who cares, you just shared this with me today. So we've been talking probably for the last 20 minutes on everything that people would consider FUD. Like I'm yeah. not trying to scare you, really. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we just need to think about the, your data points, as Ryan has said, is everything we touch today. Everything we touch has got a data point and someone's collected it, someone's going to use it to mm -hmm. Kim's point. Yeah. What's not important to me is important to someone else. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. always going to be true. Yeah. And uh, I, my view on FUD is, uh, I mean, it depends how you present it, but I think fear, uncertainty, and doubt, um, it's something that is definitely a concern and a lot of people discount, you know, the approach sometimes. But really, in my view, if we, uh, if fear, uncertainty, and doubt is really bad, if it's by having people take action unnecessarily. But I wouldn't say that we're ahead of the game. And I think FUD, you know, in a different way used um, to help people understand what's at risk and how they are at risk um, mm -hmm. is actually not really a bad thing. So that's just my my personal thing. No, I, I, I know it can I be. But... If you use FUD with a solution and a positive outcome, yeah, then it's a teaching and a learning moment. If you just use FUD to try and sell something or to yeah. gain attention, that's yeah. the negative version of it, right? Yeah. But, but I mean, that's almost goes for anything i think it's used in a positive light yep so just uh i think that was a really good discussion and it's nice that we could talk uh touch on a lot of different things one thing we didn't really talk about was within the organization um you know how is this stuff um taken on in terms of responsibility and i wanted to just ask a question in the poll about which role in an organization is most associated with data protection and privacy training? So sometimes it's the CISO or uh, some other cybersecurity role. There's privacy officers, there are risk officers. It might be just in the generic uh, learning and development, you know, within HR sometimes. But um, let us know uh, where you think this uh, typically falls within your organization. And if there are other uh, areas that we didn't mention, just use the uh, the other uh, option and put your notes in here. Um, and with that, I'll let this run for a while and move to our last open question, which is what methods can be used to help employees relate corporate data protection and privacy requirements to their personal information protection practices? We see this not often, not as often as I would like, but a lot of organizations do recognize that helping people be more secure at home translates into better security practices at work. Do you agree, uh, Fletus? I think you start at home. Um, and I know we've talked about in other calls and I've been in other situations, depending on the culture of your company, if you're more conservative versus strict, you may not be able to present a message to someone with a home mindset. But you and I all know that we can present stuff with a human centric side. I've shared on here numerous times. How does someone know when to open the front door? How does someone know when to remove a pot from the stove? How does someone know to do X, Y, or Z? Is it because of formal training? Is it the school of hard knocks? Or have they actually been burned, physically burned by a hot pot or had their identity stolen? We start with going to the human-centric side. If I can approach you where you're at and bring you along from where you're currently at, that's where I go. So that's why these round tables, the lunch and learns that we do, making ourselves approachable, knowing your no, know why you're saying no, and the employee, your peer, knows why you're saying no, goes a long way when you tell them you have to encrypt that. You have to mark that as sensitive. You have to use X technology to share something. It goes a long way because now they can do it at home. Now they understand I should password protect this. I should compress it. I should encrypt it before I just mail this sensitive information to someone. Like mm -hmm. I've had people come back and thank me. Like I won't do X anymore because I know that it can be read. So they don't use plain text email. They'll put PGP encryption on it. And they've learned how to do that by just looking it up. That's technical stuff. But it's also the same thing. They've cleaned up their LinkedIn profile after me making the comment, don't share you're running a Cisco 4600 version. <laughs> they just said, I'm a Cisco SME. Like yeah. Stuff like that goes a long way of how you talk about it. And when they're in public, they are the person who's texting some of the conversation versus talking about it because they want to share information. So they'll send it via text, a signal or something else. And then they'll have a more generic audible conversation at the airport, on the train, on the light rail, et cetera. Yeah. Ryan, what are your thoughts on uh, the personal side? 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, personal, it all starts with your personal information. And I mean, we're going to have more personal information than we do work information because we're just alive as people more than we ever going to work for one organization. So, and especially if anyone born into this digital age, I mean, as soon as you're, you know, five years old, you know, here's your first account and you start aggregating your data from, from that point on, we, um, I, I, you know, I've always, I've talked about in the past how Chromebooks have been given out to, to students now for, for years and, you know, as a, a nice gesture from Google to help the education sector, which it is, but at the same time, it's also Google's way of starting to collect data on, you know, children who turn into teenagers who turn into adults. And so I think we need to start at the very basics with, with our children. Um, you know, we have to make sure we're paying attention to all populations, but we have to talk about data in, in its privacy and its, you know, proper use from an early age. Um, so we can, again, give people education, then they can make their own decisions what to do with it. If they want to not turn off any of the privacy settings on their phone after they know all about it, that's their decision. Yeah. But, you know, we, I think until people know, you know, they, they, they see it as, uh, and I don't want them to see it as fear and, and, and scary tactics, but yeah, mm -hmm. you, you should know what your phone's collecting and, and you should know what your social media profile is displaying to the world. And you should have the same, you know, kind of care that you do around all the different data points that we collect and have as you would around mm -hmm. your credit card. Like when none yeah. of us would just leave your credit card out on a table in a restaurant while you went to the bathroom. But yeah. people leave their phones. People leave their laptops open all the time. People, yeah. you know, they upload just about everything to the internet, not really with 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 a care. So, uh, if if we're going to expect a good culture in the workplace and be able to have tight data uh, rules there, we have to start at the yeah. personal level. Otherwise, we have no hope. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think um, you know one of the things that that we often kind of mention to people is you know keep in mind that. If you post something, even if the privacy settings are correct, you know, on a social media site and they're not normally being exposed, you know, anything can go wrong where there could be a breach or maybe the site's code doesn't work properly. And so just starting by telling people and don't post stuff that you wouldn't want your grandmother or your boss to see. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> things like that can can sort of relate. People can relate to. So. But now we have to say don't post stuff that, you know, uh, uh, an AI model could, you know, re recalculate and recreate. You yeah. know, we, we have to be careful at everything and, and, you know, even our genetic details yeah. of 23 and me, right? We, again, everyone assumed it was going to be secure and private, but nope, it was password stuffing. Got someone into the 23 uh, and me and 23 and yeah. me's response to those users. Well, you should have had better passwords. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, sure. I mean, a whole other conversation here is when there is data breaches, who's responsible um, I think one thing we haven't touched on, which could be a whole other conversation, is is with laws and uh, rules around that. I know there's, you know, different states have different laws in, in, in the United States. Like California has very strict data privacy rules, much like, mm -hmm. you know, the European Union does. But mm -hmm. Canada doesn't. And we don't have a lot of, you know, uh, we haven't been as progressive as other nations when it comes to that. So you need to understand your own, you know, region's laws and, and rules and stuff to kind of fall within it and what you are protected and who's at risk it's and who's liable for it all yeah yeah i think it's... the other thing there too and ryan touched on this and i don't want to beat it up too much is we need to educate the next generation a little better than what we've done today um mm -hmm. i i have mentored numerous high school and college students who no longer see data privacy as something that's even important to them because they're like my mom and dad posted so much about me I have shared so much about myself. My school has shared so much about me going back to the Chromebook, iPads, whatever, that even if I wanted to clean up my data, I don't have the cycles or the time. They already feel defeated at 18 to 25 about the amount of data yeah. that has been shared about them. And to be honest, we start as harmless. Like I've posted about my kids. I mean, mm -hmm. for a parent, maybe think twice about posting that first day of school that lists your child's teacher their yeah. hobby, their favorite thing, and all this stuff, it's harmless. But if I really wanted to social engineer the school, I could say, hey, Johnny is in Miss Smith's class in first grade at this elementary school, mm -hmm. and I'm the custodian here to pick up this child. And if the school doesn't follow their policy, Johnny just got picked up by me because I know that Johnny yeah. is in Mrs. Smith's class and he attends this school. Yeah. Again, not FUD. Those are the things. But, yeah. but reality, I think, is the difference, Fleetus. This is reality, and this is, I think, what people are missing is uh, the new, the new approach on old tactics, right? Yeah. So, I mean, 
you know, committing crimes, you've always had to do kind of that reconnaissance stage, you know, the, to, to figure out, you know, your victim and all these different things. And, and, and that used to be like an in-person, a real life thing, you know, all these yeah. movies and TV shows we've seen for years, but now it's a, it's a quick Google search and yeah. then it's a Bing search and it's comparing the results, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then it's, and then it's some open source intelligence. And in 30 minutes, you can build a profile of, of, you know, where you go for your coffee, so you know yeah. where where is your office? Where's your house? Okay, now I know where the kid's school is. I can draw you a map, and I can put like I can time code that map, and I can understand your route. You know, and and it, that can all be yeah. done in, in a matter of minutes without even having to leave, you know, my office. And so, you know, you don't want to scare people, but you have to give them the examples yeah. of how these things are happening, so then people can make better decisions. Because yeah. I love proud parents. I'm a proud <laughs> uncle myself. You know, but every time I see on LinkedIn a picture of someone's kid, I cringe and and and, oh, I, I, and I don't have enough cycles myself now to send messages being like, you know, because it doesn't always resonate yeah. well. But hey, as a security professional, I just wanted to give you a heads up that yeah. this is, you know, this is a little much. Um, Some of the and, things oh, I was just going to say, Ryan, yeah. uh, w these things, I think we're going to start to see, we're going to learn more over time about the effects of what you know, bad practices have been in the past, right? And one that sort of comes to mind as we're talking about, you know, the, the cavalier nature of, you know, data protection over the last little while of people on social media is you're starting to see people who were the social influencers who, you know, were posting about every day of their new baby and the child growing up. And now we're seeing like those families are ruined, <laughs> you know, because of the data that's been shared about the child and, yep. and the families and stuff like that. Yep. So if we keep an eye on what's happening uh, that, you know, has kind of proven out to be a risk, then we can educate people more about what is real. One, one like okay, yeah. side tangent, like we don't understand the risks of human trafficking and, and how it's created from the internet. And it's created from unfortunate posting of your children, their locations, yeah. their, you know, their, tagging them in a social media profile so now you're exposing their social media so now someone has the ability to contact them directly and coerce and and, and talk to them like basically 98 percent of human trafficking now happens through and because of the internet right it's not in real life anymore yeah. people are not being abducted and, and all of these things it's all you know through online mechanisms and as parents and people connected to parents and family members we have to uh, stay on top of these things. And again, I don't want to be the whole fear and scary <laughs> thing. It's just the reality of how things are happening in the world today. Yeah. yeah before yeah. we get to this poll, I want to go back yeah. to yeah. something. We've been talking digital again, and I want to bring yeah. up Kevin Mitnick again. We have to be very careful on what we throw away. Ryan, you've talked about going through a rental person's trash. I can walk to a corporate office who didn't put it in Iron Mountain who didn't haul it away and properly shred it, they dumped it in the circular bin outside their office when they walked out for the day. Mm -hmm. I interviewed you. I didn't like you. I just threw your resume in the trash. Again, I already talked about what could be on the resume. I didn't mm -hmm. like how you did this. I just balled it up and threw it in the recycling bin and the janitor picked it up. So yeah, social engineering um, and with Kevin is not hard. I mean, we do it with the internet, but I can still walk out to your trash right now. Like, oh, you know, I was... Holidays. All the time you throw so much away over the holidays when you purge i for one didn't purge correctly the other week and i got a little scared for a little while i threw some stuff away that i thought i was i <laughs> shredded and i didn't shred it so i was paranoid yeah. for a little while watching to make sure it got from the curb on the truck it was in the landfill i still monitored for a little while and to this day i think i'm okay but who <laughs> knows someone could go through that yeah. landfill and eventually find some of my old tax documents that i thought was in my shred pile but they got thrown away simplistic it was in a shred pile versus actually going to the curb yep yep yeah uh, i was just recently speaking to um uh, someone who works as a red teamer and it was, he gave me this great insight that uh, during covid it like you couldn't really read you couldn't really do any of your in-person activities anymore uh so a lot of the the you know the social engineering and the you know intelligence gathering and stuff just stopped right but now that covid's over and everyone's opening up and going back to the office physical red teaming apparently is thriving because no one's looking for it and no one's yeah. suspecting the fact that real people are out there committing real crimes and, and that are that are walking by desks. And now that we're all going back to the office, I think we've all been comfortable with our virtual environments and the fact that, yeah, I can say my desk is clean because no one's going to walk into my office. Right. But now that you're back in old habits, you know, might need to be uh, tidied up because the amount of information to flee to this point that I think is being left out and physically accessible uh, is quite high.
And, you know, as a reminder, spring cleaning is coming up. So make sure you spring clean uh, correctly. <laughs> yeah. Use your shredder. Um, <laughs> well, so uh, go ahead. Add one more towel for spring cleaning. This is also time to go change your privacy setting on all those apps on your phone. Remove yep. the old apps that are no longer there. They're just collecting geolocation. Mm -hmm. Log out. Also, once you log out, go check your credit card statement and absolutely unsubscribe from the subscriptions you've been paying for too. That's giving away your credit card information month over month as well. So spring cleaning applies to your apps on your phone, to your subscription models that you're paying, et cetera, yeah. too. So like that's your data. Like again, yeah. this digital it, it is spring clean, spring clean your own. In my, there's a great app for Android. You know, I, there's probably an iOS equivalent, but for Android, it's called Bouncer. And basically what it does is it resets every permission um, for every app on your phone back to it's basically installed state so it's mm. a quick way that you can just make sure that you you know if you accidentally clicked allow location all the time and stuff without having to jump through your settings and everything it'll just reset everything to give you mm -hmm. that clean state where you again get to make those decisions about what data you're going to share perfect excellent okay uh we're getting close to the end already geez um this <laughs> quite a discussion so i did want to uh just review our poll results and have any discussion uh in the chat or uh among the panelists uh so the first question was does your organization deliver data protection training for employees to protect so sensitive confidential information and yeah overwhelmingly uh eight of 10 uh, who voted on it said, uh, yes, they do. Um, so that's good. Um, and then what types of data do employees most need to be trained on? Uh, this was a multiple choice, so people could have select more than one. Um, so interestingly, confidential operational information is one that I just sort of threw in there because it, it isn't often mentioned, but it's up there at the top, actually. Um, that's really interesting. And uh, there was other, um, I think somebody put in uh, another type of information. I can't remember what was in the chat now. Uh, if we go back and just look at uh, the data uh, responses. Um, it was what, your data may not be important to you, but important. Yeah, Kim's, Kim's uh, comment said, what you don't consider important can be important to somebody else. For example, your geolocation can be important to marketers, yet it might not be important for a lot of us. So that's a really good point. Um, so yeah, thanks for the comments on that one. And then uh, the question of which role or function of the organization is most associated with data protection. Um, so most of the organizations uh, have a privacy officer, which is great. And then uh, there's, there's also some uh, coverage by the CISO and cybersecurity group and risk and HR. Um, and then for role, somebody put another uh, comment in, which was uh, legal. Yeah, Kim uh, said legal is also... Um, something, especially in, in many organizations, privacy does roll up under under the legal department. So uh, really good point. Awesome. So um, with that, I'm going to go back to our uh, slides and just finish off the discussion. Um, we like to sort of identify what are the key insights that we've identified here in terms of uh, things that we can advise at executives or things that are helpful for people implementing or for individuals. I think we covered a lot of stuff for individuals and certainly some insights for people implementing programs. And maybe the organizational uh, information was helpful to executives as well in terms of their uh, structuring programs. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll just uh, do a quick uh, ad for Click Armor because it pays for these sessions to be done. And uh, really just wanted to let people know that Click Armor is a really interactive, unique kind of platform that helps fill that gap between, you know, the training, the boring training content that we expect people have done, but don't actually absorb necessarily. And our phishing simulations, which really just test people on their ability to do phishing, uh, spot phishing messages. So we try to put uh, that something in the middle there that helps people uh, reinforce uh, a lot of information about threats, especially we have a module on privacy. We have several actually for different uh, regulatory environments like HIPAA and GDPR. GDPR, et cetera. Uh, but it's all very interactive, uh, helps create a more engaging and effective uh, result. And also it's fast to deploy and easy to tailor. So if you want to talk about uh, any of these requirements with respect to delivering interactive content for training, please uh, contact us. Uh, Ryan or I would be happy to help. So our next session uh, comes up in two weeks, February 21st. And we're actually going to go back and talk about deep fakes again, because there was something in the news last week uh, in Hong Kong that was a pretty big story. So I 
think that even though a lot of um, security professionals are saying, well, deep fakes are still not that convincing, they're easy to detect, well, they're starting to work pretty well on a lot of people. So I think uh, we'll bring some real stories and talk a bit about, you know, uh, what can we do to help uh, employees uh, counter uh, the deep fake threats. So hopefully you'll be able to join us in two weeks, uh, February 21st at 1 p.m. Not daylight time. I keep forgetting to change that. It's Eastern Standard Time still. It'll be daylight soon, I think, in a few few weeks, but uh, we'll see. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. I appreciate uh, you, uh, Fleetus, joining us on the panel. And really thanks to everybody for uh, coming. I hope you'll spread the word and come back next time. Don't forget to join the uh, the uh CSAF site, members.cybersecurityawarenessforum.com. It's where we post all of the recordings as well as discussions and other news uh, of interest to security awareness managers. So I uh, really want to grow that uh, community and uh, make it a focal point for collaborating. So for now, uh, that's, it. that's it for this session. Thanks very much, everybody, and we'll see you next time.